Inyo. I'm a geneticist. And um, it's funny how very often when I'm invited to social events, so I go out for dinner and meet new people. And uh, when they ask me what do I do, and I say I'm a geneticist. And I usually, you know, they stop talking to me and the conversation ends. But when I say that I actually work on cancer research and I'm trying to find new ways to treat cancer, it is very interesting that uh, not less often, I mean very, very common, that uh, I, I hear them asking me, so actually uh, there is a school of thought that says that cancer is not really a disease. So what are you really researching about? Or that, you know, cancer must be a pharmaceutical ploy to make more money. Uh, because 20, 30 years ago when I was, you know, growing up, we never heard about cancer. Or you would hear someone say that my grandfather smoked for 50 years, 60 years, and he never got cancer. He died when he was 90 years old. So I'm not going to get cancer. So we might think that a lot of these assertions, um, usually an illusion of knowledge, but it's benign, and perhaps, you know, I just say, oh, whatever, and not bother about these conversations. But the reality is that these narratives, um, especially with the advent of social media and, and various different fake news outlets, um, are dominating a lot of these conversations. And the negative impact on patient lives, patient outcomes, people's lives, and ultimately our battle against cancer. In fact, in the last two minutes or so, somewhere around the world, 10 people have just died from cancer, and about 20 people have just found out they have cancer. So this is our battle against cancer. So what is cancer? Cancer cells are essentially your normal cells that have acquired superpower abilities. But, you know, unlike Spider-Man that learns that with big powers comes greater responsibility, these cancer cells, unfortunately, acquire them for their own needs. They acquire the ability to grow faster than normal cells. They acquire the ability to evade the immune system. And finally, they acquire the ability to invade into other parts of the body in a process you may have heard, which is called metastasis. And this is what usually leads to death. So an important part about battling cancer and finding the cure of cancer, finding new ways to treat cancer, if not a cure, is that to understand how cancer actually happens. And scientists over the years have actually identified that the genetic mutations are the basis of cancers. So what are genes, right? Um, I'm not wearing one, um, but I guess one of the speakers will be wearing one. But the reality is basically uh, genes are essentially certain components in the human DNA. So you've probably heard of human DNA, and you know that all the cells in our body have the same DNA, unless it's acquired new mutations. But in general, each one of our cells in our body has got this long string of DNA. In a small little cell that's micrometers, how long do you think that DNA is? Do you want to guess? Six meters, not quite. It's actually about 1.8 meters. Uh, and to imagine, if our cell was the size of a ping pong ball, if we were able to uncoil the DNA, it would actually reach from where I'm standing to the moon and back. Each cell has these three billion pieces of information in that DNA. And within that three billion pieces of DNA, we have segments that code for specific recipes. And these segments are called the genes. And these genes code for what makes us who we are. They are proteins. So you could imagine that genes are like recipes, which then your mom or you cook, and the proteins are essentially the food that you actually eat. So you can imagine if there are some errors in the recipe, the food might not taste that great. And in cancer, what we find is that the genes that control a certain process called the cell cycle is mutated. So what is the cell cycle? The cell cycle is a series of processes that allows a single cell to divide and to duplicate. And if the cell is damaged, it gets deleted or destroyed in a process for some of the biologists out here called apoptosis. And then new cells are actually made. 
And this is the process that allows the two half cells that become one cell into the trillions of beautiful cells that you are. Some probably a bit more cells than the other. As you reach adulthood, the amount of cells that are, get in a that are born and the cells that die are about the same, which is why you maintain a certain size or, or shape, or you don't grow that much taller after you reach puberty or adulthood. But of course, there are some of us who continue to grow, uh, but probably horizontally. Uh, but that's not necessarily the number of cells, but actually the size of the fat cells. Anyhow, if the number of cells that are you know, developing are less than the number of cells that die, what will happen is that your tissue or your organs regress. But in cancer, the cancer cells acquires these mutations in the genes that control this cell cycle. And what these mutations do is that now the recipe encodes for proteins that accelerate the cells to divide and essentially remove all breaks in the cell cycle so that the cancer cells end up growing and growing and not dying, which is why you see them as huge masses in the body. So that's what happens. More cell birth than cell death. So we always imagine that cancer cells are essentially a huge mass of tissue. But the reality is that cancer cells are actually extremely heterogeneous. Within a single tumor, the cancer cells are continuously evolving. And what happens is that as you can see, multiple different colors representing different clusters of cells. And when cancer therapy that normally works, where patients undergo chemotherapy, radiotherapy, or surgery, and they see that their cancer has disappeared, um, what happens usually is that although the majority of cells have died, you have some resistant cells that have either been driven by the therapy or actually was existent even at the start that are actually like tipping, ticking bombs that are extremely dangerous because this is where you get cancer resistance um, and also uh, basically ultimately uh, recalcitrant cancers that cannot be treated. So how do we get these cancer cells and how do we get these mutations? It's usually because of the carcinogens and the environment that's actually exposing it. But we also now know that our own cells also acquire mutations spontaneously even if we lived the most healthiest lifestyle or we lived in a little bubble. So this is a really loud, messy diagram. But what it shows is that the DNA continuously gets various different insults. Some of the insults are out there, but some of the insults is actually inborn. But luckily, in our cells, in fact, there are some genes that encode for proteins that help to repair the cells before the, the DNA before it actually duplicates. But you have individuals with impaired genes. For example, you've heard of Angelina Jolie and the mutation she has for the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. Um, what happens is that she can't repair, her body does not repair the damage that it acquires. But even with all of us who maybe don't carry that particular mutation, even with the perfect genome, unfortunately, every time the cell divides, we are acquiring new mutations. And so, this is just an example of how you find a cell, um, a layer in your, in your body. It could be anything from your bladder to your lung and what have you. If the cell acquires a mutation, if the mutation does not confer a growth advantage, that's fine. But if the mutation acquires, is, uh, that's acquired grants a, a selective advantage to grow, then what will happen is that these particular cells will start growing. But as it acquires a second mutation, a third mutation, a fourth mutation, you could see how now that, that particular mutated cell is slowly transforming into what we identify as cancer cells. And ultimately, it divides and becomes a whole group of clusters of cells that uh, compositely form a tumor that might actually invade. And so it's very important for us to understand when we think about why certain patients with specific diseases um, you know, certain, like two people that have the same cancer, same stage and great, yet one responded and another, it's because no single tumor is the same. In fact, it's really like a lottery that you don't want to win. 
the combination of mutations that your cancer cell actually harbors determines what actually uh, is the behavior of the cancer cells. And that is why some cancers appear to be more aggressive, some cancers appear to be extremely easily treated, and what have you. And only 5 to 10% of all cancer patients have a strong family predisposition. 90 to 95% of individuals that acquire cancer basically acquire them not because of an inherited predisposition. So who are these people that um, have an inherited cancer risk, if you're wondering? So these are individuals that normally have at least two family members on the same side, either the mother's side or the father's side, um, and, and they've had cancer, so that increases your, your risk. Secondly, the cancer patients uh, themselves uh, happen to be below 50 years old when they were diagnosed, so we understand the age factor of it as well as the fact that they have the same types of cancers or cancers that come from the same family, so like breast and ovarian or certain stomach and, and colorectal cancers, or if they already know that they harbor that particular uh, information. So if you know that, then you probably can go for a genetic test and identify what is your elevated risk, and that's, that probably becomes a little bit more absolute. But for most of us, what does this cancer risk mean? Right? Um, and that is usually equated as the lifetime risk for you to either get cancer or die from cancer. So it's essentially probability or a chance and trying to understand that. And this is where people then think, oh, that's why my grandfather had you know, smoked forever and he didn't get cancer. But that's because your grandfather was lucky because the mutations that he would have acquired just did not happen to hit on those necessary genes that confer the cancer phenotype. So that's something that you, know, you need to think about. In the UK, and why you think cancer is so serious, that they think for individuals that were born after the 1960, one in two British citizens will actually have cancer. In Malaysia, so far, the statistics between 2007 and 2011, which is the most updated, one in 10 males and one in nine females will actually get cancer. And when we think about ethnicity, you'll find that amongst all the different ethnicities, the Chinese have got the highest lifetime risk. But don't be too perturbed because statistics sometimes doesn't really reflect. If you are feeling, oh, thank God I'm a Malay, all right? <laughs> <laughs> the reality is because that, um, there is an element of individuals actually going out there and being more health conscious and getting diagnosed as well as the fact that there are other diseases that affect the other ethnicities. In fact, when you took, look at the life expectancy for, that, that has just come out this year, it's the Chinese um, ethnicity that has uh, shown the greatest or longest life expectancy. More importantly, as we understand, as I mentioned, how you have to acquire these mutations, and most, muta most cancers have around 20 to 50, to some even have 100 can, uh, mutations before they actually become cancer. So you can imagine that there is a time period in which from the first mutation to cancer. And we normally talk about most cancers evolving across 20 years from the time the first mutation to actually being diagnosed. So the majority of cancers, both in the males and females, usually happen after the age of 30. Um, most of those earlier probably is from a predisposition. predisposition. And you'll find that after the age of 60, males have a higher risk uh, from cancer. So how does my risk increase? And I always talk about how the environment is a huge uh, factor. And that's because we now know that the environment not only mutates the DNA, but it can also influence the recipe. So almost like you know, the food could be determined by the mood of your mother, right? Um, and when we talk about epigenetics, and I know we had a talk today on beauty and what have you, and I was not sure because I, I didn't find the negative axis, and that's where I probably feel I belong. Um, but I think the understanding of genetics basically is also helping us to understand faith, uh, cellular faith, the cell faith, as well as how we actually behave or how we actually you know, interact. So for example, if this was the idea of male beauty during Renaissance, um, in 21st century Malaysia, if Michelangelo actually existed, I'm certain male beauty would be like this. Although the DNA is still the same, but of course the phenotype is now different. It's not very nice to laugh, all right? Yeah. 
Um, and so that is why there is an element of prevention. And we understand that if cancer was equated to a journey, the longer you're on the road, your risk of accidents will be higher. And slippery roads or drinking, drinking, uh, driving without um, your seat belts or bad weather are like slippery roads and potholes are like the carcinogens and the risky lifestyles and the environment that we live in or we actually partake that increases our risk for cancer. So for example, up to 42% of cancers, because this research has been done in the UK, are preventable. And smoking is the single largest preventable cause of cancer. I'm watching you. And you will find that there are many different factors and there are many different things that you should be thinking about, from keeping a healthy weight, to eating fruit and vegetables, to talking about infections. Um, every single factor here really reduces your risk if you were to take into account. And how does it do that? One example, 15 cigarettes a day will actually induce one mutation in your cell, and this will be a mutated cell, and you have to be very lucky if it doesn't actually cause cancer. So can I predict my risk accurately? The answer is really no, not yet. There are actually no blood tests out there, even if there are commercial companies that are claiming to, that can actually predict your risk accurately. But if I do get my cancer, and what is my risk of dying? You know that there is improvement. Science, research, and development has shown great improvement in these last 20 to 30 years. Chemotherapy, radiotherapy, surgery, the new immunotherapies, small molecules, all reduce our chances of dying from cancer. And there are new drugs that are out there that are changing the way cancer is being managed. And I'm looking at these demographics. I'm certain the way cancer is perceived in the next 10, 15 years and treated will be completely different. But the reality is that you'll find that certain cancers obviously are better, have better prognosis as others. But I'm certain that with more research, all of this will be increased. And one research that I don't have time to actually talk about it, but I hope I'll be invited again, is to talk about the work that I'm working with many different uh, partners uh, in trying to use viruses, yes, the scary viruses, to actually invade and kill cancer cells. And we have successfully actually killed. But when we test it in multiple real light cancer models, what happens is that although the majority of cancer cells die, there are still some resistant cancer cells. And this is the battle that many people are trying to find in the very different therapeutic modalities that they actually have. How can we actually target these cancer cells so that they do not result in failure to therapy? So science connecting the dots, I think it does. It helps us understand the disease, and it also helps to improve. But ultimately, greater communication is the key. Thank you.